Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The San Antonio City Council discussing whether developers who take city money for their housing projects will have to take housing vouchers to fill them. The council members discussed the proposal in a special meeting this afternoon. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us what it would do. There has been a lot of conversation about the use of city incentives for housing development and, and expectations when we do. City Council considering an ordinance that would mean going forward that housing developments can't turn possible tenants away simply because they'd be using housing vouchers like Section 8 to help pay their rent. But it wouldn't be every property. The ordinance is very narrow. It only applies to those projects that we incent. Participating in the housing voucher program is generally voluntary, but this ordinance would mean projects that get incentives from the city, like fee waivers or tax abatements, would have to accept vouchers. Refusing to, under the city staff's recommendations, could mean having to pay the city back. Originally, staff recommended a $500 Class C misdemeanor fine on top of that, but some council members bucked over using a criminal penalty. Recommendations this week to remove the criminal penalty and rename the ordinance from source of income anti-discrimination helped soothe last week's most vocal critic, District 8 Councilman Manny Pelias. And I think this is a really, really big improvement on what was presented last week. And so you got my applause and my support. City staff acknowledged there's also a larger discussion that needs to happen about the voucher program itself. There is much more work that needs to be done with our partners to help identify, you know, how many vouchers we need, what are the value of those vouchers, and developing that education campaign. A vote on the ordinance could happen as soon as next week. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. It has been one month since Texas opened up back to 100% capacity, but many businesses still can't open at full capacity. They don't have enough employees. It's a problem for many industries all over the region. Businesses we spoke to say many people would rather stay on unemployment or they've been laid off so many times they're nervous to get a job again. For a business owner, that's the hardest thing to deal with is when a customer tells you there's an open table here, you know, why can't you sit us there? And you've got to tell and explain to them that you don't have enough staff. Back in November, Texas reinstated a mandate that unemployment recipients prove they're actually searching for jobs. Workforce boards across the state determine how many searches people must show. The Texas Workforce Commission website shows the minimum in Bear County, three jobs searches, three job searches per week. We have learned the name of a man killed in a crash on the city's south side over the weekend. The Bear County Medical Examiner identifying him as 36-year-old Rudolfo Borrego Zamora III. This happened Sunday morning on Southwest Loop 410 and South Zar Zamora a little before 2.30. According to police, Zamora was riding his motorcycle when he hit the back of a pickup truck and was thrown from a, the bike. At the time, officers said they believed Zamora had been hit by another vehicle after that crash. That pickup lost control, crashed into a divider. Zamora there died at the scene. The pickup driver was arrested on suspicion of driving drunk. The new brothels releasing new information in connection to an accident where a man died after crashing into two 18 wheelers. It happened yesterday just before 2 p.m. on I-35 North. The driver identified as 39 year old Matthew Patek. The brothels police say Patek was speeding when his pickup truck crashed into the rear end of the first 18 wheeler. As a result, the pickup continued forward until it got stuck underneath the rear of a second 18 wheeler. Patek pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the first 18 wheeler taken to a nearby hospital for non life threatening injuries. No one else was injured. The Bear County Sheriff's Office needs your help to find the driver involved in a hit and run case. This case has been unsolved for more than a year now. Here's a photo of that vehicle. BCSO deputies believe the suspect was driving a 2015 maroon Toyota Avalon. The crash happened off East Loop 1604 South last year on April 16th. Deputies say the suspect hit and killed 26 year old Antonio Marquez. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. Anyone with information asked to call Crime Stoppers at the number on your screen, 210-224-STOP. Castle Hills police have arrested two men on charges related to groping teenage girls who worked with them. As Katrina Weber reports, the accusations came to light after what may have been months of misery for the alleged victims. They were trouble times two, according to Castle Hills Police, for at least three teens working at the Sonic restaurant on Northwest Military. 27-year-old James Crow was the latest arrested, taken into custody yesterday. 
He faces the same child indecency charges as 23-year-old Daniel Martinez Jr., who was arrested last week. Some of the girls that work at there at the Sonic, it's Sonic restaurant here in Castle Hills, came forward uh, filing, wanted to file complaints for sexual assault. An arrest affidavit lays out those complaints made by the girls all under the age of 17. They say their two former bosses repeatedly made unwanted sexual advances, including pressing up against them and groping them. Police say one suspect was shocked when he was arrested. They either didn't know or they just elected not to you know, care about what they were doing. The girls told them the suspects did it for months. They finally reported it a few weeks ago. All three of the teens told police that the unwanted touching started soon after they got hired here. And police say for one, that was as far back as September of last year. It could have been that the uh, victims uh, were not coming forward and, and they just let it go until it finally got you know to be too much. Police now want to know if there are other victims and they're urging anyone in that position to speak out too. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A woman's recovering tonight after she was trapped in her SUV following a collision with a VIA bus stop on the city's west side last night. It was actually a VIA bus stop. It happened along Wilson Boulevard near Calabria around 11 p.m. According to police, the woman headed west with her young daughter when she rolled over and into the bus stop and then a fence. The little girl was able to get out of the SUV on her own, but firefighters had to rescue the woman. She was taken to the hospital with minor injuries. Her daughter was not hurt. No other vehicles involved in the crash. New at six, we haven't seen too much evidence of it here yet, but technically we are in severe weather season and hurricane season is coming. Both can mean heavy rain, flash flooding, and people in the wrong place at the wrong time needing to be rescued. Photojournalist Robert Samaron shows us how the Department of Public Safety, Parks and Wildlife, and other agencies are getting ready to fly when they need to. So we trained a lot, but you can never have enough training. We generally do this training right before hurricane and flood season. This gives us an opportunity to practice with our partners. Well, every year it gets more complicated. On the north side. So we're running multiple scenarios in multiple locations. One of the biggest struggles that, that we have whenever joining a group of folks is that communication piece between all those people. It takes a lot of coordination and we have our joint air command. We're about to get a better high res map. That runs all our op. 102 should be landing at Bullets any minute right from here. And what we've seen is an improvement in communications. The jock is dispatches to each aircraft. What, what, depending on which aircraft suits the needs, they'll send that aircraft out to perform the rescue. This is our way of setting up for hurricane season or any flood event in the state of Texas. And we always try to work with our other entities in, in performing rescues. This is a little bit more slowed down because this is a training evolution. So what we've done is we're using a raft with someone paddling to simulate a car being swept away in the river, which happens quite often. And so we have a person that's stuck on top of the roof of the car and then another person that's fallen into the water. This happening in real life so that everyone can kind of get a taste for that. So that when we have the real calls, we're able to accomplish that mission, rescue those folks as fast as we can and get to the next mission and the person that needs our help. Photojournalist Robert Samaran on that story. All right, there's a live look from 281 South at Loop 410 West, and you can see as cars exit 281 to get on 410, it is very slow going both on the ramp and on 410 itself, but no major traffic tie ups to tell you about at this hour. And new at six, plastic waste in many cases is choking our oceans, piling up on land. Now a team at the Southwest Research Institute has a solution that can help the environment. As we head into Earth Day, Tiffany Huertas has a look at a recycling technique that's turning piles of plastic into useful chemicals and fuels. We're looking at how can we take some of the materials that are typically thrown in the, the landfill or the oceans ultimately um, and, and monetize that. Eloy Flores is the Director of Research and Development for the Chemical Engineering Department at Southwest Research Institute. His team is using a process known as pyrolysis, breaking down plastic waste and turning it into an oil. 
Here we, we inject different types of plastics. Flores says the oil can be made into chemicals that can be recycled into plastics, chemicals for the chemical industry for many different products, or into fuels for transportation. So the goal of using pyrolysis for mixed waste plastics is to ultimately help the environment. While plastic is used in many ways, it is also causing a lot of pain to the environment. Primarily as a pollutant in the ocean, obviously it interacts with the animals, it causes the animals problems, which then affects the food chain, which then ultimately affects us as humans. And it's filling up landfills. Plastics have a very long lifetime, so they're biodegradable, but it takes hundreds of years. Flores says they are working with different businesses across the world. We could definitely see this as an add-on for the city of San Antonio or, or any organization uh, as a way to produce either fuels or finished uh, chemicals that can be used. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> we keep flip-flopping seasons, it feels like, Adam. Yeah, we started our day at 47 degrees. It was chill, chilly out there, especially with the clouds early now. Sunshine, and we made it up to 70 for the high temperature. I do want to point out the aquifer. It's down another foot today. We're about 19 and a half feet below the average for this time of year. And if you haven't heard already, stage two watering restrictions are in effect. Mold is high today at 1700. Oak still moderate at 120, but it's definitely on the downswing. We've made it over the hump with the oak season still out there and again moderate, but getting better and improving. Pecan and grass both on the low end. Temperatures now some 60s in the hill country, 70s south, 72 Halota, 67 Bulverde, meanwhile 73 Pleasanton and 70 in Hondo. This evening, not as breezy, partly cloudy. Another cool night though, so don't put the jacket away quite yet. We're going to talk about that, how cold and where, and how much rain we could get in the days ahead. Coming right up. Thank you, Adam. The time has come to pay up for what happened in Monday's game between the Spurs and the Pacers. Which members of the silver and black will be paying? It's hard to believe. And how much? Still to come in sports. Plus, we know there are side effects when it comes to the different COVID-19 vaccines. But what is normal? What should you be expecting? And when should you go to a doctor? The answers next at 6. Now is the time for everyone over 16 years of age to get vaccinated. Unlike the target groups where we've made such great progress, the broad swath of American adults still remain largely unvaccinated. President Joe Biden urging younger people to put aside their hesitation and get vaccinated. Today, he even asked employers to offer paid time off for workers to go get the shot. It's because vaccine hesitancy still continues to be an issue. Ursula Perry explains why the potential side effects of the vaccine are getting so much attention, but shouldn't be cause for concern. Vaccine arm, shot shivers, Pfizer fatigue, Moderna malaise, whatever you call it, doctors say it's completely custom made according to your personal immune system and likely your age too. So part of that um, is probably because you have more of a robust immune response when you're younger. University Health Dr. Bowling says if you don't have a vaccine reaction, it's no reason for concern either. Some people just don't, no matter their age or health circumstance. That's something doctors are still drilling down on for answers. One thing they do know is that not having side effects is not a sign. So just to reassure people, if they're not having much in the way of side effects, it doesn't mean that the vaccine's not still, your immune system is still going to work. It doesn't mean that your immune system is sleeping on you. But then there's the theory that many of us have already had COVID but didn't know it. And that, too, will affect the severity of the vaccine side effects. For people that have infection already, their immune system's already primed to that COVID virus. And so when they get that first dose of vaccine, they may notice those symptoms that people tend to recognize more with the second dose if they've not had the infection. Of course, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been placed on pause while experts take a look at that blood clot connection, but the two other vaccines are still on the market and doing fine. If you already have had COVID-19, you've probably been protected for about 90 days. If you still want to get a vaccination, all doctors ask is that you wait at least 10 days after those first symptoms began. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. We have Sky 12 this evening. We up do. And about a beautiful view the from the Alamo. Alamo. And what a nice day to be outside today. We got past the cold spell in the morning. Turned out to be very spring like. 
Adam. Yeah, and it was you know legitimately cold for this yes. time of year. Okay, visitors from up north are laughing at us right now. Ha <laughs> ha, take it in, fine. 60s. Laugh yeah. at us. Yeah. But hey, we were down to 47 this morning in San Antonio. We missed the record by only four degrees. Austin Bergstrom Airport actually did break a record low. So we do have another cool night in store, so don't put the jacket away quite yet. I think you'll need it again tomorrow morning. Then we have some rain chances to talk about, and I really want to start with that and the rainfall potential. What could we see, how much, generally speaking, and where? So let's get to our pattern right now. A decent amount of cloud cover in central Texas. That's some of what we had earlier today in north Texas now is where that's moving. But no rain falling from those clouds. There's activity far to the northeast of us moving away, but we're focusing on that swirl that's over Nevada, just north of Las Vegas. That's the disturbance that's going to be dropping in and should help help to kickstart some thunderstorms as we get into Friday afternoon. But between now and then, we'll also have some other moisture that's likely to come. Not a whole lot, but something. So let's talk about this. I like our future cast. Tomorrow morning, a little bit of sunshine right at sunrise. Then the low clouds fill in by the noon hour, gray sky, and a few hit or miss areas of drizzle or light sprinkles through the afternoon. A few sprinkles, areas of drizzle. It's going to come and go through tomorrow afternoon, evening, tomorrow night, and the first part of Friday as well. So dampness. Yes, maybe a light shower here and there, but we're talking a few hundredths of an inch for most folks. We do this again as we start Friday, and that could actually compound, you know, from those passing sprinkles and areas of drizzle to maybe a quarter of an inch here and there. We'll talk about the accumulations in a second, but then we get into Friday afternoon and the focus shifts to the potential for thunderstorms, especially if we see the sky really clear out in time on Friday, then that'll increase our instability and add to that thunderstorm potential. Right now we're thinking the greatest odds would be east of I-35, but even locally we could have a few storms pop up, and if they do, they do run the risk of becoming strong to severe. And this yellow area indicating where we have the greatest potential within our neck of the woods of the severe thunderstorm. So should they develop, it would not surprise me at all if some of them became strong, severe, maybe large hail and some straight line winds. So something we're going to watch closely. Of course, if we get a few of those downpours with the thunderstorms, you could quickly get an inch of rain. But excluding that potential, because not all of us are going to see those storms, most of us won't. Let's talk about the rainfall, just the general potential here, probably about up to a quarter of an inch around Bear County. That's from the sprinkles, passing light showers and drizzle just compounding over about a 18 to 24 hour period. You go east of San Antonio, Lavaca County toward Houston, one to two inches. That's because they have the higher likelihood of the thunderstorms by Friday afternoon. So that's it for the rain. Let's talk temperatures. There's that morning low of 47, average is 60, and we only made it to 70 for the high temperature. Right now we're at 68 with a dew point of 31. It's comfortable outside. Good evening for outdoor activities. You don't have the stiff wind that we had yesterday. Bandera 68, comfort now at 67. Converse area 66, Port SA now at 69 and some 70s south of town. So tomorrow morning near 50 degrees, but I do think we'll be in the 40s in the hill country. So a bit of a chill in the air, not as cold, but you'll notice it in the morning. And then by the afternoon, the low clouds limiting us. So probably upper 60s to right near 70 here in San Antonio. You go south of town and it's going to be a little bit warmer as usual. Those Drizzle and rain chances basically increase throughout the day. Again, don't anticipate a lot from that. If we're lucky up to a quarter of an inch through midday Friday, the potential for thunderstorms, we think about 40% into Friday afternoon. And cross your fingers because that's where the downpours would be, the real rainfall. Then this weekend, sunny, low humidity, upper 80s, a bit breezy at times, especially Saturday. All right, well timed. Thanks, Adam. All right, I am not happy with the NBA. Mm. I'm, it's going to affect their Yelp review with me. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of questions. Patty yeah. Mills didn't do the headbutting. He was the headbutt E. He was. So, I, and how does he get fined? And the guy who did the headbutting barely is going to pay a little bit more than Patty yeah. Mills is fine. But of course, he's sitting out tonight. But Mills and Rudy Gay get to play. But I agree with you, Spree. I don't really think that this fits. Coming up, we'll have more on this uh, Mills Gay Jakar Sampson find. Plus, we had some NLI signings at Kennedy High School coming up.
Brewers guard Patty Mills $25,000 for his altercation with the Patriots to car Samson Monday night. Spurs forward Rudy Gay was fined $20,000 for his role in escalating the situation, and Samson was suspended one game without pay for headbutting Mills. There was no mention of a fine for Samson, but suspension without pay for one game based on his $1.8 million salary is roughly $26,150. The conflict occurred during the fourth quarter when Samson shoved Patty after the two were getting physical on the other end of the floor when fighting for rebounding position. After shoving Mills, Samson then escalated the incident by headbutting Mills, which caused Gay to step in and shove Samson. Patty and Rudy were both assessed a technical foul, and Samson was ejected from the game. So Patty, Rudy, and the Spurs will host the Miami Heat tonight, 7.30 at the AT&T Center. Spring football camp is winding down for the UTSA Roadrunners, which will be capped off by a spring game. Coach Trailer said he's just waiting on the details. Coach said they got pretty beat up last week, nothing major, but they had to come off the threes, and they were only able to work ones and twos during a scrimmage. He said the threes are getting healthier. Coach has 12 super seniors on the roster, which is turning out to be a good thing. Thank goodness for super seniors and able to bring back, you know, some players that kind of bought us a year to get that uh, line room uh, fixed as far as our numbers to have a the ability to function in the spring and have depth all during the fall like you need to be successful, especially as much as we want to run the football, right? And that's hashtag 2-0 triangle of toughness. It's, that's number two on the list. So we want to be able to run the ball and start for those big boys up front. Coach said he's waiting on five freshman offensive linemen to come in to give his O-line some much-needed depth. Take you to Kennedy High School, where yesterday the Lions had two student-athletes commit to the next level, Jaron Salias and Alejandro Hernandez. Jaron played running back and linebacker for the Lions during his senior season. He's going to Texas Lutheran in Seguin and said it's amazing because he'll be close to home, allowing his family and friends to watch him play. Whenever I went there, just they treated me like I was family just from the get-go. They're such a tight group of people, and just everything just felt like home to me, and it felt like the right place to be. Alejandra signed with the University of Houston at Victoria. She chose that program, she says, because it has an amazing nursing program, and it's a perfect fit. High school golf has helped pave her way. It was very important to me because golf is actually a really hard sport to get into. Um, you've got to focus, you've got to maintain your grades, and every day I've been practicing, even on the weekends. I hardly get any time to myself, but it's worth it because that's what's going to get me to get a degree. Kennedy High also recognized the class of 21, valedictorian Paige Tam on the left and salutatorian Emily Cruz on the right. Congratulations to all four students. And how about a quick shout out to those who competed in the Region 4 3A Women's Golf Tournament it wrapped up yesterday in Kerrville. Senior Adriana Calvillo, seen here, represented Natalia High School. And thanks to her dad for reaching out and sending us the picks. And congrats to all the teams and the seniors for their hard work. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. some big accomplishments. Yep. Thank you, Larry. You got it. Still upset about the patty. Thing. I know you are. I'm, I'm going to let it go. <laughs> You're not. Ser serenity now. <laughs> Our case on Q&A is up next. <laughs> It is something we have seen time and time again in our community. Pedestrians being hit by motor vehicles, bicyclists being hit by motor vehicles. What should be done? What can be done? Activate SA is a group that has some ideas. Jeff Moore and David Bemperod join us for KSAT Q&A. And uh, guys, your reaction when you hear of these incidents, especially with bicyclists and, and the one that happened just outside of KSAT, this bicyclist was pulled over on the sidewalk when they were hit by a car. Yeah, I'll take that one. It's a shock that runs through the cycling community. It's, uh, you know, it's thousands and thousands of, of bicyclists all over San Antonio, but everybody knows someone who knows someone. So, so there's a flurry of messages sent out every night, anytime this happens, and it's really a personal uh, thing for, for cyclists. It, let's talk a little bit about the work that you all are doing to try to curb that problem. Uh, David, I'll, I'll ask you this. Just tell us what Activate SA does. Uh, what, what's your ultimate goal? Absolutely. Activate SA advocates for a connected active transportation network for the San Antonio region to make sure bike paths and wide sidewalks are connected, equitably built, and sustainable to meet our 2020 climate goals. What does that mean in reality? I mean, what do you guys want to see 
the city of San Antonio do now uh, as far as this Absolute, goes? Absolutely. The, the fact of the matter is we can't stop every drunk driver, but we can build the necessary infrastructure to make sure that drunk drivers aren't killing cyclists and pedestrians. We can build wide buffered cycle tracks, protected sidewalks with shading and lighting to make everybody feel safe on their roads. You know, years ago, the city started talking about this very issue. So it's not like, as Steve mentioned, this is not something new uh, that the city needs to address and is trying to address. So are we on the right path as a city? Have we made good strides in the last couple of years? I think the city's made. Go ahead. Uh, in 2015, San Antonio was the first Texas city to declare Vision Zero, where n the goal of having no cyclists, no collisions on our road wide. But in between 2014 and 2018, we did have 121 severe cyclist injuries. So there is work that needs to be done, but our city staff really do care. And we know implementation takes time, but we want to be out there supporting our city leaders and giving them ample community support to implement this bold new infrastructure. Jeff, you wanted to answer this question as well. I'll let you chime in. Sure. And the city's doing a great job, but our idea is to get this on the 2022 uh, bond cycle. And if we do that, we can compress the timeline of creating these, these projects. And they are projects. Each one of them are independent pathways with a beginning and an end that's connecting a, a population center to something like a, a trail system or a park. We can compress the timeline rather than 10 years of working on little segments of road that may not ever get connected. We can we can build out in three or four years completed segments that that have a beginning and end and they are connective and they are protected is it is there a f level of frustration though that it's taking so long because i want to say wasn't there a broadway corridor plan for opening it opening it up for bikes and opening it up for pedestrians that that kind of has been shelved and and we don't know what's going to happen with it right now well, we really expected that to, to have some sort of bike facilities, and it looks like that's not in the plan anymore at all. Uh, the bikes, uh, uh, the bike facilities are being pushed over to either Alamo, Alamo Street or Avenue B. So that, that was a big letdown for the cycling community, and that came right in the heels of uh, Tito Bradshaw and Dr. K's death. Um, it was really hard for the community to take that. And, and that's something that I want to make sure people understand who may not be into cycling. That's not their their preferred mode of transportation. Just to, to impress about why this is so important. Certainly no one wants to see someone injured or killed. But this isn't just about making sure you can ride your bike when you want to to go out and enjoy a Saturday afternoon. This is about being able for a lot of people to get from point A to point B, which has much more far reaching implications than just recreation, Jeff. That's right. This is about also um, equity and, and economics of the situation. San Antonio's downtown area, especially, is still a service uh, economy. We, we depend on tourism. So a lot of people are, are either taking via or riding their bike or doing some sort of a, a combination of both of those. So this would also serve that segment of the, of the economy, as well as riders everywhere throughout the city. It sounds like you're targeting 2022 for a big bond issue to kind of build up some of these uh, widened bike lanes, widened pedestrian sidewalks. Uh, are you getting interest? Are you getting commitments from some of the politicians in the city and county? Every day. Uh, last month, Mayor Nuremberger noted in a city council session his three top priorities, his, his three pillars for successful 2022 bond projects, public health, resilience, and connectivity. Those, threes, those three pillars aren't just part of Activate SA's framework, that is within our DNA. Making sure that public health, when you wanna get out on a sidewalk, you wanna go on a run, go on a ride, that you can safely. That you, this is meeting our climate goals by getting more people out of their cars and more people walking and biking to work and connecting not just our 13 regional centers, but between every neighborhood, every major park, and every ma major civic institution. We're just about out of time, but I want to end with this. What's your message to drivers who maybe take a route to and from work every day that has a lot of cyclists? Just what would you tell them to look out for, whether that's a cyclist they see all the time or infrequently? What should we know? Yeah, you should look out. Uh, uh, you should watch your speed for one thing. And we, we definitely want to to do something to slow down, uh, distracted driving, DWI, DUI, things like that. Uh, those are the things that are 
that threaten our existence completely. So um, definitely keep your eye open. Look, look out ahead of you. Uh, don't take your eyes off the road for sure. Activate SA is the name of the organization. I just want to say when it comes to bikes and pedestrians, that's one part of what you guys are looking at. But you're, I mean, for lack of a better word, a think tank to kind of see how we could improve our community. So I appreciate both of you guys, Jeff and David, for stepping by, stepping in with us and talking to us about specifically bicyclists and pedestrians. Appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. We'll be right back. Spring is in the air for most of us in Rochester, New York. They are setting snowfall records. Look at that. The city got blanketed with snow this morning. 1.6 inches. That makes it Rochester's snowiest April 21st on record, going back to 1870. It's not the only spot feeling the spring chill, though. More than 70 million people in the U.S. are dealing with freeze mornings from the plains through the northeast. And suddenly, I don't feel so bad <laughs> about the 40s that we had. You know, it, it could always be worse. Oh, it was oh. chilly, though, for us this morning. That's true. Yeah, and even the freezing, some parts of North Texas. I'll show you those areas and how cold it got coming up. You look outside right now, you see just a few clouds lingering around town. Temperatures are going to fall off again, and there will be a bit of a chill in the air again tonight. 68 right now, but by 8 o'clock, low 60s. Midnight, mid 50s. Tomorrow morning, sweatshirt. Light jacket for the kids at the bus stop will be down near 50 degrees. We'll talk about temperatures and how long this cool weather is going to hang around, when we're going to warm up, and more on that rainfall potential coming right up. In the buzz today, Polaroid has introduced the smallest analog instant camera in the world. It's called Polaroid Go. The company says the device is around two inches tall, three inches wide, four inches long. Even the film for it is a miniature version of the classic Polaroid film. The camera features a selfie mirror, very important, self timer <laughs> and travel friendly accessories. It does not make phone calls. The Polaroid Go costs around $100, already available for pre-sale. It goes on sale April 27th. Those other cameras we have, they're the ones that make the phone calls. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Instagram users getting a new tool to filter abusive direct messages. The filter looks for certain words, phrases, even emojis. There's a list that's compiled by Facebook, which owns Instagram, and it allows people to add their own words to that. This new feature will also make it harder for people who've been blocked to come back around with a new account. Yeah, but users will have to activate this feature. It doesn't come on automatically. Facebook is trying its new filtering tools on Instagram first. The hope to bring them to Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp before next year. Social media platforms have been struggling with how to prevent abuse on private messages since that content is not scanned the way public posts are. April 21st is National Kindergarten Day. Friedrich Wilhelm August Froebel is credited with starting the first kindergarten in Germany. In 1837, kindergarten is actually a German word. It means garden for the children. It was developed as a way to help young children adapt to being in school. The first kindergarten in the United States opened in Watertown, Wisconsin in 1856. To celebrate the holiday, say thank you to a kindergarten teacher in your area, maybe even on social media where you can use the hashtag National Kindergarten Day. Oddly enough, I was having a conversation with friends over the weekend about our kindergarten teachers. Mm -hmm. I remember mine, Mrs. Pelfrey. You remember really? yours? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Bird. <laughs> Mrs. Bird. Okay. Come on, Steve. Come on. It's escaped me. No, uh huh. I, I think it's Mrs. Dyke. Mrs. I think that's Dyke. it. Could be. Mrs. That's Pelfrey, it. Mrs. Bird. Yeah. Thank you. I Thank remember. You. I remember getting dropped off to kindergarten on the very first day. You do. Yeah. Resurrection School in uh, Minneapolis. Yep. First day. I was crying. Oh, don't leave. And then five minutes later, oh, this is fun. Isn't yeah. that? Where are the thermometers at? Goes. That's what you said. Secondly, I think I was playing with the glue or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you know my cousin said you can like eat this? Yeah. No, I dare you. <laughs> That makes all the sense. Yeah. Doesn't it though? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on from this. Another cool night ahead. Not as cold, but you'll notice a chill in the air. Some sprinkles and drizzle on the way. And then we have some storm chances. That's not gonna be until Friday afternoon. We're gonna talk more about that in a moment. Let's start with temperatures. Look across the state this morning. Amarillo, 28. Lubbock tied a record low of 28. Abilene, 32. 
That is a record low. Wichita Falls, 34. Midland tied a record low of 35. We were feeling the chill in the air everywhere. And here in San Antonio, we were good four degrees shy of the record. That's it. Well below our average low of 60. Right now across the state, you look at the temperatures, some 50s and 60s to the north, even Alpine at 67. Meanwhile, 68 San Antonio, Junction only at 58. Parts of the hill country in the upper 50s, but Fredericksburg right now at 62 degrees and it gets warmer as you go to the south. Laredo right near 80. L looking ahead to tomorrow morning, keep that jacket handy, you sweatshirt for the kids at the bus stop because we'll be in the upper 40s in the hill country, but near 50 degrees around San Antonio, even 46 Gonzales, 53 Uvalde. By the afternoon, we're not going to warm up a whole lot. Most of us right near 70, especially in and around San Antonio. I think most of the afternoon will be spent in the 60s, topping out at about 69 Stone Oak, 71 Lackland area. You get to Lavernia, 71, along with Elmendorf and New Braunfels, right around 70 degrees. So not much of a change temperature wise in the afternoon, but we do see things change as we get into Friday and especially the weekend. Friday we crack 80 again, but into the weekend we'll be right near 90 and it looks like we'll stay there for several more days. So let's get back to the rain chances. Just some clouds across parts of North Texas now. We're looking at the big swirl in the air right near Nevada. Of course, all that precipitation and activity in New England, that's moving away from us. We're looking at this disturbance, this ripple in the upper level flow as it drops into northern Mexico. That's going to make it here on Friday. That's what could trigger a few thunderstorms. You need something to get the atmosphere going. That would be the disturbance. Until then, just says little light sprinkles and showers as the drizzle action tomorrow morning a little bit of sunshine but most of the day is going to be gray and then becoming damp notice our future cast two o'clock not really showing much on the radar screen but we'll have some areas of drizzle some sprinkles and i think they'll be more pronounced as we get into the evening and nighttime hours so a little bit of dampness developing throughout your thursday that's going to be the case for the first part of friday Morning dampness, morning drizzle. If you have outdoor plans or anything uh, scheduled for Friday morning, expect it to be damp, not necessarily pouring rain, but just dampness with sprinkles and drizzle. By the afternoon, that's when we could actually see that extra lift from that disturbance and a few thunderstorms developing, especially east of San Antonio, but even hill country and locally, we have that potential for some storms. And if they do happen to pop, it wouldn't be too difficult for them to become strong to severe. Excluding the thunderstorm potential for the few folks that are lucky to get those downpours, we're looking at maybe a quarter of an inch around parts of Bear County, higher accumulations eastward, especially at the Hallettsville, Smiley area, even Quero toward Houston. You'd have the potential of an inch or more of rain. Cross your fingers. I'm crossing my fingers for everybody. We need it everywhere. So 50 in the morning, 67 by the afternoon, a little drizzly and sprinkly, especially later in the day. That's going to be the case through Friday morning into the weekend. We're looking at sunshine, low humidity and a bit of a breeze, especially on Saturday. All right. Thanks, Adam. By the way, it. somebody just delivered some Elmer's for you. <laughs> Kasky, I just want to let you know. I already tasted no, it. It's no, good. Oh, geez. In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Wednesday, April 21st. A man is behind bars after complaints made by three underage employees at his workplace, the Sonic Restaurant on Northwest Military. Castle Hills Police arrested 27-year-old James Crow yesterday. He and 23-year-old Daniel Martinez Jr. accused of making unwanted sexual advances toward three of their employees, all under the age of 17. The teens accused the two former bosses of pressing up against them and groping them and say it went on for months. A man is in the hospital, another man in handcuffs, following a shooting near St. Mary's University. San Antonio police say a 38-year-old man was shot in the thigh in the 3100 block of Culebra Road. That's right near St. Mary's University. He was taken to University Hospital. He's expected to be okay. A witness gave a description of the suspect to investigators, and they managed to find the suspect at a bus stop not too far away. He was taken into custody. We have no word on a motive. President Biden speaking today on a major goal he set when he took office, saying today the U.S. has reached 200 million COVID-19 vaccinations. The milestone, however, met with an increasing number of cases and hospitalizations. 
The CDC reporting about 67,000 new daily infections. A new episode of KSAT Explains is out, and this week the show is about one of the most widely debated items on the May ballot, Prop B. If approved, Prop B would repeal San Antonio Police Union's right to collectively bargain. So we lay out what Prop B would and wouldn't accomplish if it's passed. KSAT Explains Prop B, available on demand right now at kset.com slash explain. Cloudy, damp, drizzly, and a bit cool tomorrow. Most of the afternoon will be spent in the 60s. Friday, we're going to start the day the same way, and then by the afternoon, we could see a few storms pop up. But warming up and humid Friday in this weekend. Anything goes outdoors. Sunny, low humidity, 80s to right near 90 for highs. Anything goes, according to Caskey. <laughs> Get creative. Okay, <laughs> but not with glue. No. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Keep the glue away with. from Caskey. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you, Ted. Good for your system, right? <laughs>